Thanks for watching this video. My name is Ivis Bauer, and you're about to watch a presentation on some general insights on how Fairware Foundation works towards payment of living wages. Wages are perhaps the most central issue when it comes to Fairware Foundation's work and uh, where it concerns social standards and international supply chains in general. Uh, virtually every issue uh, that's relevant in our work has a wage-related dimension when it comes to overtime work for people working in the factories, uh, injuries uh, because we, people have to work fast and make more money, discrimination in the workplace between female and male workers, or child labor because children need to bring more money home. Everything has uh, a linkage to wages. And that is why Fairware Foundation has adopted from its establishment the principle of payment of the living wage, which is what all the companies of Fairware Foundation signed up for. Um, the most important thing about payment of living wages is the underlying principle that everybody working in a factory uh, that's producing for one or more Fairware Foundation member companies um, should in the long run be paid a wage that is enough to sustain a certain standard of living uh, that allows to live in a certain uh, dignity and to also support their family members. Uh, so this all boils down to uh, supporting workers in financing their basic needs. Now, let's have a look at what basic needs um, really look like. What, 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 what does that encompass in, in, in its full essence? It should be enough to afford um, housing, um, so a roof above your head, uh, a safe place where you can live with your family, the energy that you need to, to heat that house and to have lighting, uh, nutrition, potable water, clothing for yourself and for your family members, uh, education, childcare, um, healthcare, if needed, transportation, also some money to save up uh, for uh, unexpected expenditures. Now, the best way for Fairware Foundation to work towards and to sustain living wages is through social dialogue. And that means um, collective bargaining between employers and employees on the factory level. Uh, we believe that in the long run, uh, that is the most sustainable way for wages to be um, upheld on, on, on a level that sustains workers' basic needs. The reality, however, is that in many of the countries where our member companies and also clothing brands, clothing companies in general are producing, um, do not have a very reliable setting when it comes to collective bargaining. It's either not secured in, in local legislation or in practice it's compromised. And in those countries, we're facing a challenge that we are still um, we still need to make progress with our members, um, but there is no direct entry point to, to work with local uh, companies to engage in the collective bargaining processes. So we need to come up with something else in the short run. Now, what we have uh, been doing since the last five, six years is to collect through local stakeholder consultation a variety of benchmarks, um, giving insight in the cost of living. In, a specific city, in a specific region, or in a country, depending on how, uh, how big the uh, textile industry is in that local setting. Uh, so we collect local living wage estimates that have been put forward by NGOs, by trade unions, or by other uh, reliable and credible parties. Uh, we collect, if available, information on local collective bargaining agreements. Um, of course, we also take into account the local minimum wages, uh, we look at the uh, national wage statistics, average trends that we see surface in a specific time frame. And also, because we go to so many factories in, 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 the, in the bigger countries where our members are active, we also have a good idea of local best practice wage levels, and we include those too. Now, what does that look like when we are sending our local team of experts to a factory? As you may know, Fairware Foundation works with multi-stakeholder other teams who are making uh, an in-depth assessment of working conditions in a factory during the factory audit. Uh, and as a part of that process, they also take a look at wage levels. So they talk to workers outside the factory, inside the factory, they interview factory management, they review the existing documentation where it comes to working hours and wages. And that whole process gives us a good idea of the bandwidth of wages, so the upper level, the lower level, the different departments where production is happening. 
We depict that in the wage ladder, as you see here, and we compare the different data in the departments that are active with the available benchmarks. So in this example, you see that there are uh, benchmarks such as the minimum wage, um, the local average wage for migrants, we have Asia floor wage plus a living wage estimate um, that was put forward by a local NGO. What we do then is include this wage ladder in the audit report and we ask our members to identify areas where progress needs to, make, needs to be made first. So, um, can we see indications for discrimination between men and women, for example, in the departments where men are predominantly active, are wages higher than the departments where most workers are female? Um, do we see any areas where workers are paid below the minimum wage? In those cases, uh, member companies have to act uh, very quickly and report within a specific time frame how they have resolved that issue in cooperation with their supplier. And over time, we can also compare how factories are making progress. If you're going back to a factory and um, correct the different benchmarks um, with new information, uh, we can actually see if the, uh, the trend is get, telling us that wages are going up. And, for example, going up more than local inflation. And we're getting in closer reach uh, from one of the benchmarks that are in the picture. What is very important in these uh, wage ladders is the quality of the data. Um, any company can collect data uh, like, like, uh, like we have included here, but the process of collecting the data will tell you how reliable the data are. So if you don't do proper interviews with workers, if you don't have enough time that local specialists spend in the factory, it's um, questionable how reliable the data are, and that will also give you uh, maybe a weaker foundation to discuss progress uh, with your suppliers. So the process of collecting data is very important. Now, the wage ladder is made available as a public resource on Fairware Foundation Network. You can find them here. And Fairware Foundation member companies, but also non-members in other industries, can uh, register for free for the wage ladder. You can get you, yourself a, a username and a password and you can play for any production country where we have um, collected data with the available benchmarks. You can enter data on your own suppliers and see how they compare uh, against the benchmarks. Now, if we are making uh, an assessment of wages in the factory, we're basically just making a snapshot at a specific point in time. We know uh, where areas of improvement have been identified and we know maybe how big the problem is. It doesn't tell us how we should work on the solution, and uh, that's of course a whole different question. Now, Fairware Foundation works with um, requirements for brand member companies on their management system level, and one of the requirements is that member companies have to evaluate their pricing policy, uh, which basically means you should ask yourself as a brand whether the prices that you're paying to your suppliers are giving you enough financial space for your suppliers to close the gap towards living wages in the long run. Uh, we actually measure efforts and results made by member companies through our um, annual brand performance check. The guide is available on our website. Uh, many of you have already read it. Um, and that guide will tell you how we allocate points to companies actually making progress and actually making uh, realizing results in the process of working towards living wages. So uh, the requirement here is that member companies need to assess to what extent their prices are high enough. And uh, well, basically, if you look at the wage ladder, um, you need to ask yourself, uh, where am I positioned? How high am I up, or how, how high is my supplier up from, from this benchmark? And where are I below the benchmark? What does that cost us, in theory, or in practice, even better? Fair information helps member companies on the way by looking at their product costing breakdown, and what we basically look at is the factory working minute cost. Um, so we are asking those member companies who are willing to, to go into that learning process with us to tell us um, how they have calculated product costing before sending um, the order to their suppliers, how high material cost is, how, how high uh, factory margin should be, cost for shipping, cost for um, also wholesale and retail. 
And if we look at the factory working unit cost, um, what, we basically, what we basically can do is replace that number with a higher number, assuming that we are working towards a higher benchmark. So we basically need to calculate how high factory working minute cost will be if we are working with a different wage level. So taking that requirement towards members as a starting point, we also want to facilitate that learning process with them. So what we do is we offer them the option to go through their product costing uh, by reviewing their uh, product pricing data and seeing how we can uh, calculate with those numbers if we are assuming that we would pay a higher wage level. Basically replacing the existing wage level with the level that we know relates to a higher benchmark. So what we basically do is we look at uh, the factory working minute cost and we see how that number changes if uh, our member companies are willing to pay a higher price and if the factory is paying a higher wage level. So since 2010, Fairware Foundation has participated in a number of projects together with a variety of member companies where we looked at how their products and how the prices of their products were affected by hypothetically increasing wage levels. Um, we can look at an example here where we have um, different factories producing items in Vietnam and China, making um, jackets and bags in different factories. You actually see that if you look at the same benchmark, Asia full wage, the, the impact on wages is, is actually quite different. So there's the gray area um, in China, for example, in Jacket 2, it's quite high, and the red area is relatively limited, meaning that the wage increase needed in that factory to pay Asia full wage is still high, but relatively low compared to the other factories, especially um, the bag factory in Vietnam, bag 1. Um, this figure also tells us that there are strong income differences between uh, different regions in the country and that um, we need to have balanced data on cost of living and to take those regional differences into account. As part of those projects where we have looked at cost impacts with our member companies, we have also learned quite a bit about a dynamic that we now call compounded cost escalation, which basically means that if we are raising wage levels in a specific factory for a specific item, uh, for example, uh, being a wage increase of one euro, um, can lead in um, the dynamic of existing supply chains to a price increase um, on the retail level of 15 to 20 euros, uh, which is basically the result of companies working with existing margins um, in different stages of the supply chain and they have gotten used to working with the same percentage for a specific product category. If we want to make sure that products do not become incredibly expensive in the retail level, we may have to address how these pricing models work. And that is how we are ending up with non-compounded cost escalation, which is a very hypothetical exercise which we're doing with companies, but it's a way to illustrate to them how they can still make the same amount of money by selling the same amount of clothing in the same shop but just increasing wages on the factory level. Um, this is a very uh, controversial way of working with companies and we're not prescribing to companies in any way how their prices should be calculated but it's a very important and useful way we find to get companies into a process of reconsidering how their prices are defined and how their pricing dynamics work in the supply chain beyond their own responsibility. Now, if we are moving on from that step to the step how to make sure that workers are actually receiving more money, we're talking about wage, living wage engineering. Um, living wage engineering is basically about the question how can we make sure that if member companies are willing to pay a little more, how that money ends up in the pockets of the workers producing their items. So the rank and file workers um, sitting behind the sewing machine, cutting the fabric, etc. Um, we have made um, some interesting progress with some of our member companies um, on the question how productivity increases can absorb cost increases. And that's actually a way of making sure that um, wage increases do not have to be escalated down the supply chain to higher retail prices. Um, in addition, some of our member companies have actually committed to increasing um, prices and accepting a lower margin um, just to experiment with the question how they could make sure that the workers would receive more money as a way to close the gap towards living wages. 
they're not paying living wages to all of the workers in that supply chain. Uh, that's that's, that's uh, too big uh, statement to make at this point. But they are making progress in closing the gap proportionate to their leverage with those specific suppliers. Maybe the most fundamental element in working towards living wages is to promote social dialogue in factories. Uh, we cannot make any sustainable progress if we are not empowering those parties who in the long run have to bargain for their own wages. So, as Fairware Foundation, we see the whole living wage costing engineering uh, dynamic as a way to create space for collective bargaining. In the long run, workers and factory owners, employers, need to use that space to find a new balance and a new way of negotiating about wages, which allows workers to um, support their families and, and, and meet their basic needs. With Fairware Foundation, we have developed the Workplace Education Program, which is supported by the United Nations Fund to End Violence Against Women, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Swiss NGO Bredvall, Bredvall. And we're now working in four priority countries to create um, a strong foundation in factories for social dialogue, uh, to engage workers in discussion processes with management. It's still a long shot um, to say that we're getting close to collective bargaining in these countries, but this is, uh, in the long range, the target of the Workplace Education Program. And actually, we're, we, we're making plans to roll out to other countries too, with similar approaches. In conclusion, working towards living wages is a challenging task. We have a long road ahead of us, but we are making progress. Um, we are happy to work with our member companies and stakeholders uh, to make, continue making progress. Um, we are around for brands who want to discuss the issue further. Thank you for your attention.